Hi, I'm Dr. Allison Fong, and I'm a research coordinator here at the Alfred Wegener Institute located in Bremerhaven, Germany. So predictions are that in the Central Arctic, we will see sharp increases in primary production due to reductions in sea ice. However, the controversial comment now is whether or not there will be sufficient nutrients in the upper ocean and in sea ice to support the growth of these primary producers. Well, there's different factors that play a role in that. One is certainly which organisms are present. And the other factor is how the structure of the upper ocean changes given the loss of sea ice. You can imagine if you've ever seen this in say a cup of ice water that you have at home. If you take that cup of ice water or maybe actually a cup of juice that you place ice cubes into and you let it sit on the table, after maybe five, 10 minutes, you will see that the ice begins to melt. And so you will have juice, let's say it's orange juice, and then the ice is melting because the ice floats on the top. And suddenly there's a thin layer of ice melt at the top of your glass of orange juice with orange juice below. This is what happens during the summer melt. And what we call this in oceanography is stratification. So what you have on the surface of the ocean is a light, fresh, less salty, less dense layer of water which in this case is ice cube water. And below it, you have nutrient-rich orange juice. And because this stratification occurs, you can imagine that when ice begins to melt in the Arctic, you create the same type of layering. So suddenly, these small organisms may not be able to access the nutrient-rich deeper waters due to the increasing melt of sea ice. So what does this mean on the global scale? Does it matter what happens in the Arctic regarding nutrients and its role in productivity? It certainly does. Even though the Arctic is not large, what it is is extremely seasonally productive. And what that means is the time of the year which the Arctic plays a big role in sequestering carbon into the ocean is the summertime. And it's sequestered into the Arctic not just by physical means, of transfers of gases from the atmosphere into the upper ocean, but by the biological means of the small microorganisms of phytoplankton and sea ice algae taking up nutrients and carbon into their cells and those cells then moving up the food chain, either by being grazed upon by small crustaceans and then by fish, or by those aggregating together and sinking to the deep sea and taking their carbon and nutrients with them. So one big question that stands out for all of the Arctic researchers is in the future, will the Arctic be net primary productive, a net sink for carbon, or will it be a source of carbon in the future because of the loss of sea ice? So we must link these things together when we think about nutrients and its role in primary production. And the seasonal cycle is critical for understanding our gaps in knowledge. There are very few measurements in the wintertime of both nutrients and production. Most of our information and our knowledge comes from the summertime. Mosaic is an opportunity for us to close those gaps and to understand on a full annual cycle, what are the preconditions in winter that then support things like the spring and summer bloom of the Arctic Ocean, and then into the fall, are there still sufficient nutrients or an organisms active enough to continue productivity later into the season than anticipated? So I've talked a lot about both the physics and the chemistry of the Arctic Ocean and sea ice, and how that can change both in horizontal space and vertical space and over time across the year. But the question is really for us who are studying ecosystem functions, does it matter who is there and which nutrients they're using and how quickly they use them and to what extent they use them? And the answer is yes. Who does matter, when matters, and how fast also matters. So this is something that we are actively studying all across the Arctic in different types of research programs and certainly also in Mosaic. So you might be wondering, who are these players that you're talking about that are using different types of nutrients? Well, one big player are known as diatoms. And diatoms exist both in sea ice and in the upper ocean. They're very special. 
in the Arctic. The reason being that they exist all over the world, but in the Arctic, there are certain diatoms that have adapted to living associated with sea ice. And as I've described, sea ice exists for part of the year, and then as we move into the summer, sea ice disappears because it begins to melt. So how do these organisms live and adapt in an environment that is both at one time solid and at another time fluid? Well, they have all of these mechanisms within their cells that require nutrients to support. One thing is their cell walls are created with silica. And what's the easiest way to describe this? Well, there's that glass of orange juice again. The glass that you have, you're holding in your hand that contains orange juice is the same type of material that diatoms build their cell walls out of. So we often refer to diatoms as the organisms that live in glass houses. And silica is really important. And the question is, okay, but where do you find silica in the ocean? Silica is a major component of all of the rocks on Earth. And so the delivery of silica into the Arctic primarily comes from terrestrial origins. So all of those continents surrounding the Arctic Ocean with large rivers that flow into Arctic also bring things like silica. And that essential nutrient is important for this key player in primary production, diatoms. So what else do diatoms need? Well, they also need nitrogen. And nitrogen is a nutrient that all living organisms on Earth require. So the combination of nitrogen and silica are essential for diatoms to grow and reproduce. And people often wonder, well, are diatoms the only players? No, there are other players, players that don't live in glass houses. And these are smaller organisms known as nanoplankton. While they need nitrogen, they don't necessarily need silica. And so this means that if we have a plankton community that's comprised primarily of diatoms, versus nanoplankton, we have a different ratio of the nutrients of nitrogen being utilized compared to silica. So for instance, say that I have 10 diatom cells, and for them to grow, they need two essential nutrients, nitrogen and silica. You can imagine that how quickly they do that is different than 10 cells of nanoplankton, which do not require silica, but still require nitrogen. So these are the questions that we are constantly thinking about. And to answer them, it requires us to not only measure the amount of nitrogen and silica in the water and in the sea ice, but it also takes us finding out, is it 10 cells of diatoms and 10 cells of nanoplankton, or is the proportion different? And in nature, that proportion varies in time and space. And so it's never just diatoms and never just nanoplankton. It's a mixture. And this mixture means that the utilization of those essential nutrients also changes in time and space. So the diversity of organisms living in the Arctic Ocean, both in the water column and sea ice, have a direct impact on nutrient distributions of the Arctic Ocean. Now the question is, is what happens next? Well, what I've just described to you is what we call the bottom-up control of primary producers. So just like you and I, our growth is dependent upon what we eat. But luckily for us, there are no predators. But diatoms, they do have predators. And so smaller organisms like crustaceans or small shrimp eat diatoms and nanoplankton. And in addition, those small crustaceans and small shrimp serve as food for things like fish. And fish serve as food for things like seals and birds, and ultimately in the Arctic, seals and fish serve as food for polar bears. So the nutrients that we've talked about today that we cannot see, that are dissolved in sea ice and dissolved in the upper ocean, drive the full community of organisms that we can see all the way up to polar bears. So it's important for us to not just think about the Arctic from the sense of animal communities, but also to understand the chemistry of the ocean and how it relates to productivity. So on the one hand, the health of an ecosystem and its functions definitely depend on the organisms that live there and their interactions. But also, it depends on how these organisms interact with their physical and chemical environment. 
the Central Arctic is experiencing rapid change. The loss of sea ice in the Arctic is unprecedented. These organisms rely upon sea ice not just as a habitat and a place to grow, but also in how sea ice structures nutrient distributions, which funnel the base of the food web. So as sea ice changes and the upper ocean water column changes, what we change are nutrient distributions. And since nutrient distributions dictate the presence and growth and the rate of growth of essential organisms like sea ice algae and phytoplankton, it has long-standing and long-term impacts on what we can envision being the distributions of organisms like fish, seals, birds, and polar bears. So this is why you should care about nutrient biogeochemistry of the Arctic. It has a central role in our whole understanding of ecosystem functions. So now I've taken you hopefully what you consider a really interesting journey through nutrient biogeochemistry of the Arctic and how it's controlled by physical processes like the stratification of the ocean and ocean currents and by biological processes by understanding organisms that utilize nutrients and how those nutrients are transferred through the food web. I'd just like to conclude and say, keep track of our progress in Mosaic and join us again for another interesting exploration of the Arctic Ocean and its ecosystems.